Uh, it's good to see you all uh, for the second installment of Telling Tales, the Mythic Imagination of Tolkien and Lewis. Um, uh, today we'll be talking about the battle of good and evil. I couldn't possibly say everything, even just a little bit about everything these two had to say about the battle of good and evil. Um, but I hope to say uh, a bit about one you know, aspect of what they each had to say about this. Um, and in particular, this is uh, particularly important to me. And, and the reason is, uh, I was a junior in high school, found myself in trouble at school. I'll spare you the story. Uh, uh, and home for two weeks with not a whole lot to do. Um, and I, I pick up a, a book that's just lying around. My sister was reading it. It was Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. I was never previously much of a reader, uh, except in my younger days, but in middle school and high school, I, I was not much of a reader. Uh, not much of a, a Christian. Uh, and I picked up this book and started reading through it, and I found it absolutely gripping. I mean, I couldn't put it down. Uh, you know, I, I read it in the uh, span of a week. I mean, it's it was about that thick. It was all three volumes of Lord of the Rings, all in one. I uh, read through it in a week. I uh, encountered, you know, tales of heroism, uh, this whole different world of Middle Earth. I, you know, if you've read it, then you know. Um, and something happened to me that I, I couldn't put words on and uh, words to until probably maybe even 10 years later. Um, you know, a number of obvious changes. I became a voracious reader. I went on from Tolkien to Lewis to Chesterton to somehow I went down the rabbit hole of Walker Percy for about five years. Very different. Um, again, if you know, you know. Um, but what I, about t a decade later, what I realized had happened to me was I entered into um, a, a deeper moral universe, uh, a deeper moral reality. Uh, or, to put it differently, what I realized is I had always been inhabiting a deeper moral reality, but I didn't know it. In other words, I didn't know that, you know, in the, the little besetting sins that I battled against, that I was actually caught up in a, a battle between good and evil. You know what I'm saying? Uh, or that the, uh, the acts of kindness that I was tempted not to do, but if I did, it would require a bit of courage. Uh, might face ridicule. Uh, what I didn't realize is that that was the call to heroism. Uh, what I, in other words, what I, what I did not realize, but uh, what Lord of the Rings helped me uh, feel my way into, so to speak, uh, is that there's a, there's a great battle between good and evil. Uh, we're caught in the middle of it. In fact, the line between good and evil runs right through each of us. And however mundane our lives appear, they're fraught with these kinds of astonishingly large consequences. Um, and that we don't even, we don't even realize it. Um, you know, there are many people who go through life and think with a battle between good and evil. I mean... Uh, for me, it's just a decision about which of my urges I'm going to give uh, uh, the most food to, or which career I want to go into. Like, we, we live mundane lives, surely. Uh, what do you mean, like, asking me to be a hero? Or what do you mean telling me that I could potentially be a villain? Uh, really? Well, yes. I mean, so Tolkien, Lewis, they wrote these stories, not as forms of escapism, uh, but as ways of sort of opening our minds, our hearts, our, or better yet, our imaginations to the world that we already inhabit uh, that charges with, uh, well, that invests with a kind of electric charge every action that we commit, that we do. Okay. Uh, that's enough sermonizing for me. I, I'm going to read this. I, I didn't read it last time, but I, I really like this. This is from a poem by uh, Tolkien. Um, since we're looking at legends and stories and myths, I uh, figure I'd start with this. He says, Blessed are the legend makers with their rhyme of things not found within recorded time. It is not they that have forgot the night or bid us flee to organized delight in lotus isles of economic bliss. Of course, uh, Lotus Isles refers to that really brief scene in the Odyssey where uh, they encounter uh, folks who eat lotus, and what it does is it blunts their. It's a 
drugs of the ancient world. They, they're eating lotus and uh, floating into this glorious oblivion. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient. Before them gapes the dark abyss to which their progress tends. If, by God's mercy, progress ever ends and does not ceaselessly revolve around this, uh, the same unfruitful course with changing of a name. Okay, I'll leave that there. Uh, as I mentioned today, we're looking at the battle of good and evil. Thank you. I'm not getting sick. I, my voice is a rasp because I talk all day. Uh, it's like this every day. Uh, I want to begin with a couple of stories of C.S. Lewis. Um, and, you know, I told the, the myth last week about uh, the, the glance backward uh, as uh, um, Orpheus is taking Eurydice out of the underworld and the moment he looks back, you know, with his more rational gaze is the moment she disappears back into the darkness, which could be a warning not to spend too much time analyzing uh, great stories. I mean, they, they speak in ways that uh, escape analytical reason. Um, so in order to sort of avoid uh, overanalyzing things, what I, what I want to do is look at these, uh, a few stories, so really three stories, two from C.S. Lewis, one from Tolkien, all in some sense about evil and as it affects our oh-so-mundane lives. Uh, and then instead of analyzing it, because this has the patina of age, I'm going to draw proverbs out of it, and then I'm going to analyze the proverbs. Okay. Uh, first story comes from uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, Prince Caspian. Uh, Prince Caspian is actually the second novel in the Chronicles of Nar Narnia written by Lewis. Uh, and it takes place uh, a number of years after the original story of the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, which is a great adventure in which, you know, four uh, Pevensey children are drawn out of kind of the humdrum world of England and World War II. Uh, into the magical world of Narnia where they end up through the help of the great Aslan defeating the white witch and liberating Narnia from her icy curse. Uh, this uh, book is about another prince that will arise whose name is Caspian and uh, the f we're first introduced to Caspian uh, in chapter 4. Now what you need to know about this, uh, uh, this story is uh, Narnia has been taken over by uh, uh, a group of people, you know, they're men and women, uh, who deny all of Narnia's mythic past. You know, there are no talking beasts, there are no naiads and dryads dancing in the forest at night, uh, no dwarves, no magic, no creatures. This, this, these are just a kind of more sensible people. I mean, Narnia is now run by Philistines, we could say. So they deny the old stories. Uh, but however you try and suppress the old stories, uh, suppress the imagination, suppress the myth, it always has ways of kind of finding its way uh, into the, the imaginations of people. So uh, Prince Caspian, so I'm going to read this and make a few comments. Prince Caspian lived in a great castle in the center of Narnia with his uncle Miraz, the king of Narnia and his aunt, who had red hair and was called Queen Prunaprismia. She's not much of a character, as you can tell. His father and mother were dead, and the person whom Caspian loved best was his nurse. And though being a prince, he had wonderful toys which would do him almost anything but talk, he liked best the last hour of the day when the toys had all been put back in their cupboards and the nurse would tell him stories. <laughs> He did not care much for his uncle and aunt, but about twice a week his uncle would send for him and they would walk up and down together for half an hour on the terrace at the south side of the castle. One day while they were doing this, the king said to him, Well, boy, we must soon teach you to ride and use a sword. You know that your aunt and I ha have no children, so it looks as if you might have to be king when I'm gone. How should you like that, eh? I don't know, uncle, said Caspian. Don't know, eh, said Miraz. Why, I should like to know what more anyone could wish for. All the same, I do wish, said Caspian. What do you wish, asked the king. I wish, 
I wish, I wish I could have lived in the old days, said Caspian. He was only a very little boy at the time. Up till now, King Miras had been talking in the tiresome way that some grown-ups have, which makes it quite clear that they are not really interested in what you are saying. But now he gave, suddenly gave Caspian a very sharp look. Eh? Uh, what's that? What old days do you mean? Oh, don't you know, uncle? said Caspian. When everything was quite different, when all the animals could talk, and there were nice people who lived in the streams and trees, naiads and dryads they were called. And there were dwarfs, and there were lovely little fawns in the woods. They, they had feet like goats, and... That's all nonsense for babies, said the king sternly. Only fit for babies, do you hear? You're getting too old for that sort of stuff. At your age, uh, you ought to be thinking of battles and adventures, not fairy tales. Oh, but there were battles and adventures in those days, said Caspian. Wonderful adventures. Once there was a white witch, and she made herself the queen of the whole country. And she made it so that it was always winter. And then two boys and two girls came from somewhere, and they killed the witch. And they were made kings and queens of Narnia, and their names were Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. And they, so they reigned for ever so long, and everyone had a lovely time, and it was all because of Aslan. Who's he? said Miraz. And if Caspian had been a little older, the tone of his uncle's voice would have warned him that it would have been wiser to shut up. But he babbled on. Oh, don't you know, he said, Aslan is the great lord who comes, great lion who comes from over the sea. Who's been telling you this nonsense, said the king in a voice of thunder. Caspian was frightened and said nothing. Your Royal Highness, said King Miraz, letting go of Caspian's hand, which he had been holding till now, I insist on being answered. Look at me in the face. Who's been telling you this pack of lies? N -n Nurse, faltered Caspian and burst into tears. Stop that noise, said his uncle taking Caspian by the shoulder and giving him a shake. Stop it and never let me catch you talking or thinking either about all those stories again. There were never those kings and queens. How could there be two kings at the same time? And there's no such person as Aslan, and there are no such thing, uh, things as lions, and there never was a time when animals could talk. Do you hear? Yes, uncle, sobbed Caspian. Then let's have no more of it, said the king. Then he called to one of the gentlemen in waiting who were standing at the far end of the terrace and said in a cold voice, conduct his royal highness to his apartments and send his royal highness's nurse to me at once. Story of Prince... Uh, one, there is something dangerous about the old stories. There's something dangerous about talking about kings and queens who are not identical with uh, the, author the present authority of Miraz. There's something dangerous about the mention of a great lion who is lord over all. There's something dangerous about mentioning talking beasts and uh, dwarves and uh, great adventures not head by Miraz under his uh, ever so watchful tyrannical eye. There's something dangerous about stories in his mind. Uh, I would have you notice likewise uh, that in order to keep a hold of his own authority, he has to regulate the talk and the thinking of everyone within his realm. Suppressing uh, the venerable history uh, that doesn't, of Narnia that does not fit into um, uh, the small box of his tyrannical regime. Uh, I would have you notice likewise that his uh, first response uh, to uh, hearing these stories from the lips of his nephew uh, is to shut them down and then call for the nurse and as we imagine uh, she was soon to breathe her last breath. I'm going to leave that story there for a moment and go to another story. Uh, which comes from uh, the Silver Chair, which is my favorite of the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, the Silver Chair is about, again, two uh, children who are drawn into the magical world of Narnia, uh, Eustace and Jill. 
and they are given a task by Aslan to find uh, the long lost Prince Rillian who was last seen uh, chasing a, a mysterious woman dressed in green, uh, uh, never to be seen again. Uh, they were given careful instructions for what to do on this journey uh, by Aslan. They were told to rehearse uh, these instructions every day. Of course, they, they forget them along the way and there are lessons to be had there. Uh, importantly, they find uh, a guide that will lead them into the wilderness uh, who is Puddleglum. Uh, who's kind of half frog, half man kind of creature. He's webbed hands and webbed feet. Uh, he lives in the marsh. Uh, and he's oh so pessimistic. I mean, he can see uh, a dark cloud and any silver lining. Off they go on the adventure. Uh, after encountering numerous obstacles, including nearly get, getting eaten by giants in a great feast, uh, they descend into uh, a dark underworld. I mean, days upon days going into uh, sort of thick darkness uh, where their eyes have to adjust to the, the dim light. Uh, and they're taken captive by these odd underground creatures uh, and taken to none other than uh, uh, the queen of the underworld who happens to be dressed in, in green. Uh, they encounter a kind of bumbling, odd fellow uh, who's, you know, probably 30 to 35 years old, um, who, you know, doesn't have a serious thought uh, uh, except when he is strapped into uh, a silver chair he all of a sudden seems to be raving like a lunatic, saying he's been kidnapped, uh, bewitched by uh, the queen of the underworld, and is refused uh, uh, the opportunity to go back and uh, claim his rightful place in Narnia. Moreover, he claims that he's actually a prince of Narnia. But in his ravings, it's hard to believe a man who is so distraught uh, as he's yelling. Uh, eventually, um, he mentions the name of Aslan, and what happens is uh, Eustace, he takes his sword, he cuts the uh, silver chair, uh, freeing what he is now determined to be Prince Rillian. Uh, enter the queen of the underworld, who we now discover she's the one who stole the prince. Uh, she has bewitched him into captivity, and he's only allowed a small space of sanity each day uh, for which he is actually strapped into the silver chair so that he cannot escape when he's in his right mind. And one would expect, I mean, I, I, I remember when I first read this, I, what I expected is immediately what the witch would do, this green witch, this queen of the underworld, what the first thing that she would do would be to attack or subdue by some powerful magic uh, uh, now these four people who are trying to escape from her realm. But that's not what she does. Um, when they mention to her that they're returning back to the land of Narnia, she says, oh, and she puts some uh, odd smelling stuff onto the fire that makes this smoke that kind of dulls everybody's senses. Uh, she says, oh, well, where is that? And they say, oh, it's, it's up. It's up there. She says, up there? There's nothing but, you mean in the, in the roof? There's nothing but stone up there. Uh, I said, no, no, there's, there's a whole world up there. Oh, wow, a whole, a whole world up there. That, what, you know, I, I, what a funny little dream that you all had. They said, oh, no, there's a real world up there. I mean, there are, there are, there are stars up there. And, and there's a sun up there. And she said, oh, a, a sun? Now, uh, what's that? And uh, now the smoke from the fire and her enchantment is starting to dull their senses even more. And uh, there, there's a doubt taking hold of all of them. But uh, one of them says, oh, uh, uh, well, the sun, it's, it's like that lamp, uh, but, it's, but it's bigger. Go, oh, it's, it's like a lamp, but it's, but it's bigger. Okay, but that lamp is hanging from the ceiling. What is your sun hanging from? I said, oh, well, it's, it, it's not hanging from anything. It's just there in the sky shining down upon all. And she says, oh, okay, I see. 
oh, I see. It, it, it seems like you, you've taken a lamp and, and what you've imagined is a, a bigger one and a better one that doesn't have to hang from anything. Uh, this is quite a game you're all playing. Uh, they're growing more and more frustrated and uh, it's Jill who eventually uh, remembers a name. Uh, as the enchantment is starting to take its hold and doubt begins to take its hold, she says just one word, Aslan. For a moment the spell begins to break and the, the rest are rallied to the name of Aslan and uh, they said, yes, Aslan. And she says, oh... What, what, what is Aslan? They, they struggle to think. Uh, what, what could we compare Aslan to? And, and one of them says, oh, well, uh, do you see that cat there? So, oh, yeah, it's a lovely cat. So it's like, it's like a, the cat, but it's, uh, but it's bigger, and he's the lord of all, that, of all Narnia, the world above. And she says, oh, okay, now I really understand what's going on. Uh, this is a fun game. What you do is you, you take everything from the real world and then all you do is imagine it bigger and better and, and project it up into this world that you've all created. Uh, they're, they're baffled. And no matter what they bring up, whether it be the sun, whether it be the trees, whether it be the light of the moon, whether it be Aslan himself, uh, she has an answer that causes them to deny their memory of anything other than uh, this dark world in which they presently see by means of their senses. Uh, rather than leave us here, I'll uh, tell you what uh, Puddle Glum the, uh, the pessimist says to, to save them all. Uh, before he speaks, he, he realizes that the moment the, uh, the enchantment is going to be absolutely irreversible, uh, he takes his webbed hand and he uh, puts it in the fire. And all of a sudden, moment, his senses are cleared and limping away from the fire, he gives this speech. One word, ma'am. One word, all you've been saying is quite right, I shouldn't wonder. I'm a chap who always likes to know the worst and put the best face I can on it, so I won't deny any of what you've said. But there's one more thing to be said even so. Suppose we, we have uh, dreamed up and made up all those things, the trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and, and Aslan himself. Suppose we have then all I can say is that in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's the funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. And I'm going to live like a Narnian as, as, uh, as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. So thanking you kindly for your supper, if these two gentlemen and the young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once and setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I shouldn't think. But that's a small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. Oh, hooray, everybody says. Now uh, they're off. And it's now in just that moment when the spell is broken uh, that the witch turns into a horrible, monstrous serpent. Uh, and it's only at this moment that uh, the Prince Rillian must take out his sword and slay the beast. Uh, eventually, you, know, you, you can read it. They, they make their way out of uh, the underworld. Uh, they restore the... Prince Raelian, and they have done the task, the adventure that Aslan has set them on. Uh, what do we notice in these two stories? Uh, what we notice is, uh, among other things, I would, would suggest, precisely this very important point, uh, which is it is a denial of what is true that is the first and primary weapon of the enemy. Before Miraz perpetrates any violence uh, upon Prince Caspian, and he will, uh, what he does is he first tries to control what he says and what he thinks. To deny the reality of a world that is uh, 
larger, richer, uh, more adventurous, uh, more wondrous than his own. Uh, and the same thing happens in, with the queen of the underworld, both evil figures in these stories, you understand, uh, who are the representatives of, representatives of evil within the, these stories that C.S. Lewis has to tell. Uh, she likewise, uh, before she e uh, attempts to perpetrate any violence, what she first attempts to do is alter and twist their minds so that they no longer believe that there is a world richer, brighter, more adventurous, more wondrous than her own. Um, we often look for uh, the, the works of the enemy, I would suggest, in all the, the wrong places. Uh, before the enemy seeks to do anything else, let's say with our young people, for instance, and this is a school, and so we can reflect upon that. Uh, the first thing the enemy tries to do is to convince the, the young person that uh, the world is much smaller, the stakes much uh, less significant, uh, much less wondrous uh, than they have been led to believe by the old, old stories. Uh, that heroism is not at stake in the decision that they make. Uh, that uh, dreadful consequences for uh, uh, devoting one's life uh, to the twisted uh, attempt to sin in ever, ever more imaginable ways, that that doesn't come with dreadful consequences. You see, uh, in other words, what, what the enemy first tries to do is convince us that the world is very small, uh, that uh, the wondrous acts of God that they might have heard about are wonderful stories, perhaps, uh, and to live in a world of the enemy's own devising. Uh, so if I could draw a proverb from this before we move on to Tolkien, um, I'll add to the Proverbs of Narnia, but just one uh, for this evening. Uh, it is this, the first and most dangerous we weapon of the enemy is the lie. And um, that's how it is in, in the Bible, isn't it? I mean, what, what does the enemy do? The tempter appearing in the garden. What's the first thing the enemy does? It's, it's not to attack. It's not to use brute force. It is to uh, ever so subtly shift the frame of reference so that, oh, God doesn't want you to have uh, eat of this tree because he knows that you'll be like him and he's envious of the power that he has and he knows that you'll threaten him. He, does, he doesn't want what's good for you. Did he really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Uh, the first weapon of the enemy, uh, the one against which we must all be on guard, is the, the lie itself. Because what's the point of engaging in head-to-head uh, uh, -head combat? What's, what's the point of going toe-to-toe you know, -to -toe, uh, if he can change the frame of reference uh, and we, we give up any attempt to pursue that which is heroic or virtuous because we cease to believe in such things. You know, the world is such that uh, you look out for your own and get on as best you can and that's it. The first and most dangerous weapon of the enemy is the lie. Uh, I want to look, uh, and it's going to be really difficult for me to sort of not give you too much detail or leave important details out, so uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I want to look at uh, the, the large story of the Lord of the Rings. Now, I'm sorry if I give spoilers. Um, it was first published, however, in 1954, which means you've had 70 years now. Uh, so I don't feel bad about this, so spoiler alert. Uh, the story begins in uh, the idyllic, uh, beautiful land of the Shire, which is inhabited by hobbits, which are halflings, you know, half the stature of a man, uh, who love, above all else, comfort. They love their tea, they love their five meals a day, uh, they love gossiping about their neighbors, uh, they have moments where they cherish the beauty of the world around them, but not in any sort of high or sublime sense. Uh, you know, the world to them is pretty, it's not beautiful. Uh, uh, the world is enjoyable, it's not sublime. They're not uh, prone to many adventures. Uh, uh, they just like padding around on their hairy feet in the, the beautiful world of the Shire. And it's, uh, it's evident to a number of people that uh, 
the hobbits were modeled on just the really ordinary folk in Oxfordshire uh, that Tolkien uh, interacted with all the time. Um, you know, small hopes, uh, small dreams, small griefs, everything's small. They live in a kind of tiny little world. Uh, it's an endearing world, but it's, it's, it's small, you understand. Uh, this story uh, centers on um, one particular hobbit whose name is Frodo Baggins, who inherited a ring from his uncle Bilbo. Uh, now, all he knew about this ring uh, is that when you put it on, uh, it makes uh, the wearer invisible, uh, which comes with sort of obvious benefits. Um, for students of history, uh, Tolkien is heavily drawing on uh, the myth of the Ring of Gyges of Plato. Uh, so you can look that up. Uh, uh, but uh, I'll just mention Plato's myth of the Ring of Gyges says, look, if you could be invisible by putting on a ring, that is the true test of whether you're a virtuous person. In any case, uh, Gandalf uh, shows up, who is the wizard, you know, wise beyond the, the wisdom of men. Uh, and he, what Gandalf has begun to suspect and is soon to confirm is that this is no ordinary ring. Uh, that this is in fact uh, the ring uh, of the Dark Lord Sauron, uh, who once threatened all of Middle-earth uh, until he was separated from his ring of power into which he has poured all of uh, the better part of his power uh, and the better part of his malice that's are contained within this ring. Uh, he was separated from his ring, uh, but now, a uh, thousand years later, he's risen to power yet again, uh, and his uh, sole dream is to dominate all of life in Middle-earth. The ring came to Frodo um, by an odd sort of coincidence uh, and an odd sort of creature uh, who was Gollum, uh, this strange, uh, wraithish kind of figure uh, who lives in the dark recesses of the mountains and who treasured the ring for many hundreds of years, calling it my precious. Um, uh, as it turns out, the ring not only made him invisible, but it also gave him uh, the gift, or rather the, the curse of extraordinarily long life. Uh, uh, it's also deprived him from all sort of good company and community, and it has driven him away from the light, uh, which he, the longer he has worn the ring, he uh, has grown to hate more and more and more, and so he's uh, burrowed his way into the heart of a mountain where light of sun, star, or moon can never shine. Uh, Bilbo, Frodo's uncle, swindled uh, Gollum uh, out of his ring. Uh, he brought the ring back, and then eventually he hands the ring over to Frodo. Uh, Gandalf reveals to Frodo that uh, this ring is uh, the key to the Dark Lord's power and the only thing that can be done with it, uh, for no weapon can destroy it, no fire can destroy it except for the fire in which it was originally forged, uh, which is right in the heart of the enemy's territory, of course, uh, which is a volcanic Mount Doom. And the only way to destroy it is to take the ring right uh, uh, into the heart of the enemy's territory, past innumerable dark forces and the great army of Sauron, uh, and deposit it into the fire where it might be destroyed. Uh, one other thing you need to know about Sauron is he has taken the form of a great eye, a fiery uh, eye that sees all things uh, and is observed by none that sees all things, knows all things, and can therefore control all things. Which is actually fascinating, isn't it? Uh, that evil takes the form of an eye. Uh, that seeks to uh, master all of reality, right? To see all things uh, and to manipulate all things according to its desires. I mean, that, that's a fascinating depiction. I mean, it's hard to depict. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the Lord of the Rings films. I think they absolutely botched it. It looks silly. They, they've got this tower with a flaming eye on top. Like, what kind of villain is that? Um, the only point of being an eye, well, there are two points in taking the form of a great eye. One is that you see everything, and the other is that you're not seen. Uh, I mean, you know, we can look people in the eyes, but it gets really uncomfortable, but you can never see the gaze of another person. 
And if we happen to lock gaze, it gets very uncomfortable. You know, he has taken the form where he himself cannot be seen, uh, but he himself sees all things. Well, the ring uh, uh, must be destroyed, and so there's a company of nine people made up of a wizard, uh, two men, an elf, a dwarf, and four ho hobbits who are given the task to take the ring into uh, the heart of the enemy's territory in order to destroy it. What happens, however, uh, is uh, what we've been given a glimpse of in Gollum, who clings to this ring saying, my precious, my precious. Uh, here is a ring that confers upon its wearer extraordinary power. Uh, uh, not just invisibility, but great wisdom. Uh, not just uh, long life, but the ability to control and manipulate all others according to our own dominating will. I mean, uh, what would you do with the power of the ring? Well, that, that question begins to work on everybody within the company. And so uh, Gandalf... The most powerful refuses even to touch it, for he knows the temptation. But eventually the ring gets, uh, uh, increasingly takes the hold of one man, Boromir, who is consumed with a desire to take the power of the enemy and use it in order to destroy the enemy. He tries to take the ring forcibly from Frodo, who slips from his grasp. Uh, and what we realize is... Uh, the only way to um, uh, proceed is uh, the, the, those who will be least tempted by the ring's power can be the only ones who are trusted with it. So the two hobbits, uh, Frodo and his uh, beloved friend Sam, uh, alone, uh, well, not alone, uh, together uh, take the ring uh, you know, is incompetent as small as they are as hobbits uh, to uh, the two together to take the ring uh, into the heart of the enemy's territory. Uh, and this seems folly to many, uh, but there's a kind of odd wisdom to it. Uh, keep in mind, Sauron, he takes the form of a great eye. He sees all things, uh, or so he thinks. Uh, he sees all things that are like unto him. Uh, he sees all things that are powerful. There's not, an, uh, there's not a king in all of Middle Earth who can raise an army without it escaping the notice of Sauron. Uh, but the one thing he cannot see are two tiny little hobbits uh, who are uh, uh, the height of insignificance. That was a great pun, by the way, <laughs> that I only realized after the fact. <laughs> Uh, it's like that, isn't it, when we, when we look at things? Like we, we tend to notice only what we're focused on, but everything else escapes our, uh, our gaze. Um, uh, it's, it's so easy to miss that which is going on around us when we, are we focus with a kind of laser focus on what seems to be most important to us. Uh, or when we think we know what threatens us most, uh, isn't it, haven't you read enough stories that when you're worried about this threat undoing you that there's going to be something coming from out of your field of vision that you could see if you would just turn and look? Uh, so it is here, two little hobbits, insignificant. You could look at them and think nothing of them. They have no power. Uh, they have no army. Uh, they, uh, they have no great words of wisdom. They, they lack the ability to get people to follow them. Uh, they have nothing to commend themselves uh, in a war between two clashing powers. And that is precisely the wisdom of them being the ones that take the ring into the heart of the enemy's territory to Mount Doom to destroy it. Problem is, uh, they do not know the way. And so as it so happens, a, a guide uh, finds them, uh, the one who has been deprived of his precious ring, Gollum, who has been searching uh, ever so long to have it restored to, uh, to his possession. He finds the ring, he finds the two, he attacks them, he tries to take the ring, they subdue him, and somehow... Uh, 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 Frodo persuades Sam not to put the wretched creature to death. Uh, and that will prove to be very important in just a moment. Uh, by sparing Gollum, they win some of uh, his affections uh, and some of his loyalty. And so he agrees to lead them uh, into the heart of the enemy's territory uh, where he once uh, slipped into and was caught. 
Uh, if you read the story, read the story and you'll, you'll understand that more. But in any case, he's been there before, and so he's their guide. And he leads them, uh, ultimately, we're not surprised, uh, to their betrayal so that he could take the ring. They narrowly escape that. Um, there's a clash between Sam and Gollum, and Gollum is, uh, as far as Sam knows, destroyed, never to be seen again. But Gollum is a tricksy kind of guy, and he'll make his return in the end. Uh, Frodo and Sam make their way through the dark land of Mordor, uh, having only themselves and the fr their own friendship one with another. The kindness that they show to themselves, one another in this dark land uh, as the hope that keeps them going uh, in the land where all lights and all hopes are extinguished. Eventually, uh, the two hobbits make their way right to the top of Mount Doom. Uh, where Frodo, with this ring, uh, is about to cast it into the fire. And at that moment, the same thing that happened to Boromir, uh, the same thing that would happen to anyone who desires the ring, the same thing that happened to Gollum, uh, happens to him. Uh, this ring of power in that moment becomes precious to him. And he uh, it refuses to part with it. I mean, just in the moment, he's about to cast it into the fire. And to Sam's horror, who has accompanied him through great self-sacrificial friendship and love all this way, Frodo puts the ring on his finger and he disappears. And in just that moment, who is it who shows up? Gollum, this is the spoiler, uh, Gollum leaps out of the darkness. He wasn't dead after all. He still desires the ring. Uh, and he leaps upon Frodo and he finds, you know, feels for the finger on which the, the ring is um, uh, upon. And he bites Frodo's hand off and he gets the ring. Uh, this is where Peter Jackson gets it wrong. Um, uh, he has them, he, Peter, by the way, Peter Jackson loves the cliffhanger, like the literal cliffhanger scene. Where, you know, there's a character who's hanging like this for... How long do you think you could hold on with one hand to monkey bars? This drives me nuts. <laughs> I tried it the other day because we, we've got, you know, new jungle gym out there. Uh, for me, and I, you know, I can do like 10 pull-ups. It was three seconds. <laughs> three seconds I could hold on before like a excruciating pain in my... Grip itself gave away. Anyway, Peter Jackson has both Gollum and Frodo fall off the cliff, but, and you, you know, no one ever thinks they're both dead because uh, you know like there's gonna, they're going to look over the cliff and there's a like, guy hanging there. Anyway, that's not what happens in the book. Uh, Gollum uh, dances with ecstatic joy that the ring has been uh, uh, restored to his possession and he, in his rapturous joy, uh, he makes one wrong step and he falls into uh, the pit and the ring is destroyed. Providence has provided a way for evil to be destroyed. Okay, so that's, that's the story. I think I've got all the features. Uh, I now want to draw a few proverbs from this because I, I think this is a very, very deep story. Um, you know, I almost think, okay, there, there aren't many new stories that you can tell. Like most, you know, there are only so many stories you can tell, right? You know, a, a stranger comes to town, a, a, a man goes out of town, or whatever. There are only so many stories that you can tell, but I think, and so many, only so many myths that you can tell. I think there's something genuinely new and original about this that speaks to the human condition in a powerful way. Uh, a few proverbs that I'd like to draw from this. So the Proverbs of Middle Earth. First, the wise refuse to use the weapon of the enemy. Gandalf won't touch the ring. Aragorn, who would be the king of all the men of Middle-earth, he refuses to take the ring. Uh, Boromir wants to take the ring, and in his folly, that ends up being his downfall. Uh, you know, all of the wise and powerful, they refuse the ring. Um, and, of course, the, the ring, in some sense represents, I suppose you could say, the, the attempt to know and control all things. Uh, I mean, we could just apply this proverb, the, the wise refuse to use the, weapons of the, the weapon of the enemy, to all kinds of things. Uh, it's always to our peril 
whether we're a school, whether we're a church, whether we're individuals, to try to advance the kingdom of God by using the, the tactics uh, of the enemy. Uh, to try and, for some great end, uh, to use means uh, that are antithetical to the way in which we are to live our lives. I mean, and, and this is an extraordinary temptation. Um, and it's oh so banal. I mean, just to give you one example of how banal this could be. I once uh, had the unenviable task of having to populate the roster of uh, Sunday school teachers. I think, okay. Uh -huh. And I, what I knew is that I could, I could make 10 phone calls and I'd have it done in an hour. What, how, do you, how do you do this? I, like, you know, I could just see it. I was so tempted to do it because you know, if I didn't get people to cover it, I, I would have to do it. I could go through, what I realized is, I mean, it was sort of a dangerous, dangerous knowledge, you know what I mean? I realized I could go through the directory and I could find all the people who are likely to be the most insecure about whether I like them. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I, I know it's funny, but I'm, I'm absolutely serious. And I could have a conversation with them, uh, not so subtly implying that I'd be very disappointed in them if they didn't uh, do this very important work for the church. That's how the world works. Uh, that would get my... Uh, that would get me all the Sunday school teachers I need, um, but is it wise to use the weapon of the enemy? I mean, it, once you start using the weapon of the enemy, even if it's for a good, wasn't it for a good end? Sunday school, the, the education of our youth. Well, it's a good end, uh, but what would happen to a, a church or a youth program that uh, uses manipulative practices of guilt in order to get good work done? Eventually, you know, a, a church that distinguishable from the world. Uh, and that's just one small example. The wise, however, uh, refuse to use the weapons of the enemy. Um, in this story, it's the, the weapon of the enemy is to know and control all things. The wise rec reckon with the fact that we cannot know and we cannot control all things. Uh, that we, our weapons, might, by comparison to what we're up against, seem paltry and insignificant. Uh, but we know if we use enemies that promise greater success, that are antithetical to the nature of the kingdom of God, that we soon will be indistinguishable from the world, uh, and we will be on the wrong side of history, which is apparently what so many people are worried about these days. Second, Ordinary acts of virtue are the more lastingly effective weapons in the battle against evil. Um, I'm not the only one to say, I've heard this a lot. Uh, the Lord of the Rings is uh, a great novel about friendship between two little people. Frodo, it's a story about friendship. Uh, Ultimately, uh, Frodo and Sam went armed into the enemy's territory with a single weapon, which is uh, their uh, loving loyalty to each other. I mean, that's it. That's it. Ordinary acts of virtue, that they would be loving each other whether they're in the Shire, and they're loving each other in the dark land of Mordor. And that, uh, uh, that is, proves to be the lastingly effective weapon uh, in the battle against evil. Um, and I, I think this is important. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier the, the call to heroism. Um, uh, I'm always worried that young people will kind of hear me wrong on that. What, I, what I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting that they need to live lives of great heroic virtue. You know, living into some high ideal. I mean, I, I'm not against that sort of thing, but I, I recognize, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, how many times in my life has... has that been expected of me. Um, no, but it, rather the, the, the acts of heroism that are actually effective are the kind of little acts of heroism that are committed uh, in our lives. Um, the kindness to another person, devotion to another person, loyalty when things get difficult. 
Um, it's through those things that in some mysterious sense there's, a, there's an unseen power beyond us that uses them for a victory beyond what we anticipate for them. Um, does that make sense? I mean, in, in other words, uh, who knows what could potentially come from my small act of kindness to another person, from my willingness to listen to the struggles of another person, through uh, you know, the day in, day out loyalty that I show to the people that are most important to me. In other words, I, I mean, there are all these lands in Middle Earth. I mean, there's, uh, there's a land of Mordor, which is land of great darkness and great power. Uh, there's a land of Gondor, which is, you know, the, the last holdout of heroic men. Uh, um, there are the lands of the dwarves, and all of them, the land of the elves, and all of them accomplish great things. Uh, but none of them is uh, uh, the land that ultimately will overcome uh, the power of the enemy. It's the Shire, where what do they love? You know, tea and crumpets and beer and uh, they love nothing more than just spending all day uh, drinking tea until it's an acceptable hour for drinking beer and then th that's their lives. Uh, you know, enjoying just sort of a basic fellowship with uh, one another. And it's that. I mean, this is not sort of an uh, apology for, uh, you know, let's all go drink more beer. Um, you know, their pipes, you know. Uh, uh, it's that, ultimately, a little slice of the life of the Shire that's taken into the dark land that ultimately overcomes the enemy. I mean, I've, I've had lots of conversations, um, you know, with my assistant chaplain. And so, well, what we both agree is, like, you know, most of us are schleps. Uh, uh, most of us Christians are not capable of great heroic virtue, but, uh, but fellowship, love, friendship, I mean, these are, these are the ordinary acts of virtue that ultimately prove lastingly effective. And besides which, why, uh, why defeat the dark Lord who wants to dominate all of life if not to give us, you know, more time to, you know, drink tea, eat crumpets, and drink beer in peace? You know, so it's ultimately like, what's the end here? The life of the Shire. And what are the means by which the enemy is destroyed? The life of the Shire. So it's a refusal of the weapon of the enemy and a refusal of the goal of the enemy that ultimately makes for the virtuous, heroic person. Okay. Third. The unseen power of providence is the only guarantor of success. Um, Frodo got to the edge of Mount Doom uh, and through his, I was going to say human effort, but he's a hobbit, uh, through his uh, creaturely effort, uh, by means of that, uh, he was absolutely incapable of doing the final deed for which he has labored at great cost to himself uh, for uh, the better part of a year. Uh, he just can't do it. He cannot do it. Um, the only way in which this deed is done is that the one that he was tempted to kill, this wretched creature that he had in his power and through just a, a a small act of mercy, you know, a kind of ordinary virtue. You know, the ordinary virtue of, well, he really thought he could kill this wretched creature. The creature deserves to die, but now that he's looking at it, he can't help but pity it. Uh, I mean, that's not a great virtue. Uh, I mean, he, he had conversations earlier on about how, you know, the creature should be put to death. Uh, and then he just looks at it and there's something within him that he just can't bring himself to do it even though that would be sort of the more sensible, heroic thing to do. He's just, but a small act of mercy, and he spares Gollum. Uh, and precisely because he has spared Gollum for that small act of mercy, when he is brought to the final moment when he would cast this, you know, do the great heroic deed, uh, he can't do it. It's the small act of mercy that he showed earlier on in the story that comes leaping out of the darkness uh, that wrenches from his grasp uh, this ring and through a one dance step 
gone wrong, uh, the creature in the ring tumble into the fire and it's destroyed. <coughs> Who could have planned this? I mean, even the best, wisest possible plan was ultimately doomed to failure, and it was just um, a small act of kindness that was, almost went unnoted uh, by the reader in the story that comes flying out of the darkness that leads to success. Uh, and notice these proverbs. Okay, so you, you see that? It's the unseen, unmanipulated, un, impossible to manipulate power of providence that is actually at work guaranteeing success. Uh, and the wise know this, which is why the wise refuse to use the weapon of the enemy. I'm not going to attempt to know and to control all things because I know ultimately success is going to come from some point beyond the reach of human effort. What is, that, what is there then for me to do? Just this. The ordinary, small acts of virtue that are within my reach. Do you see why this is just such an astonishing, I mean, it's just an uh, astonishing uh, story, an astonishing myth that has so much explanatory power. Let's call our young people to heroic virtue, but let's tell them what that means. What it means is uh, loving your neighbor. <laughs> Uh, in the most simple, ordinary of ways. Uh, it means reflecting, uh, you know, reading stories and enjoying them. It means enjoying fellowship with other people. It means uh, enjoying the aspects of life uh, that God has given to us in creation. Uh, and as much as we can, as much as we can, uh, try and do it all for the glory of God. And somehow in the midst of this, somehow in the midst of this, uh, if we're willing to not think ourselves too great, the Lord might use all of this and accomplish remarkably great things through us. But that's the one thing that we can't control. Uh, all we can do is just kind of schlep along as best we can. And uh, I've been schlepping along for about an hour now. Um, and so I, let me just review these uh, proverbs and I'll uh, open up time for questions and you know, we can all schlep home. <laughs> Proverb first is the most and first and most dangerous weapon of the enemy is the lie. And from Tolkien, the re wise refuse to use the weapon of the enemy. Ordinary acts of virtue are the most lastingly effective weapons in the battle against evil. Finally, the unseen power of providence is the only guarantor of success. Uh, with that, I conclude and say, Amen. Uh, qu comments, questions, uh, before we schlep on our way. Well, I thank you for your kind attention. You're about as good an audience as I could possibly uh, uh, imagine. Uh, go in peace and um, one more installment next week. Uh, but I really uh, deeply appreciate uh, your kind attention this evening. God bless you.